Good morning. I'm excited to be here today to talk to you a little bit about relevancy. My name is Clarissa Adams Fletcher and I've been teaching for quite some time. And I had a principal in my first years of teaching who always challenged us if we were doing the exact same thing that we've been doing for the past five years. Well, that was always kind of funny to me because, of course, the first five years I had nothing to fall back on. But she would always say, if you're doing the same thing that you did in five years ago, then it's time to change. So I took that challenge on and I always tried to keep my classes relevant and fresh. And that was the best advice I probably ever got as a beginning educator. So I'm going to ask you the question, culture shifts. How relevant are your classes in 2020 or how relevant will your classes be in 20 before 2020 ends? So there's so many things that we don't know that we're going to start off with what we do know. We want to be proactive. We want, we know that we're teaching languages. We know that we're teaching students. So the combination, that combination helps to reduce our anxiety. That will reduce our anxiety as well as reduce the anxiety levels of our students. Because we know that if the students feel nervous, if the teacher feels nervous, it increases the effective filter for all involved. And what happens, they are unable to produce what they really can do. So what do we know? We know that our students want to communicate. We know that they need culture to be able to communicate more effectively. We also know that our students need to connect to things that they already know and they need to compare to their own cultures. That combination right there will make your class much more relevant, much more interesting, and make your students more engaged. It also will allow the students the confidence to go out into the community and to practice all of the skills that they're, le that they're learning. So let's focus on culture for just a minute. We have products, practices, and perspectives, and everyone knows that those three elements are key. And more importantly, we need to get past products. Our students know a lot of products, and that means that if you ask them a specific holiday or you ask them a specific um, tradition, they can tell you what is key. So we're coming up, uh, up on... Uh, let's say Labor Day, and you know that you will see fireworks, you will see flags, you will see those things. Or let's say we talk about right now coronavirus. What would be some of the products? We would see masks, we would see hand sanitizer, we would see uh, PPE. So all kinds of things that we have learned about it. What would the practices be? Well, we would see the people wearing the mask. We would see the people uh, social distancing, a new verb has come out to social distance. So those are ways in which we have changed, our culture has changed. The perspective would be, so why is it that some people want to do it, some people don't want to do it? Is it something inherent in our culture? So these are things that will help us to make our classes relevant because you're using things that will help students to relate. But there's so many unknowns. So you can take a great lesson, but you don't know so many factors. One, you know you're teaching students, but will you have a chance to build that relationship with that student prior to t beginning to teach them the content? So who exactly is the class? Is it going to be a traditional class? Is it going to be an online class? Or is it going to be a hybrid? Everything's changing as we speak. So let's say you start off with the traditional class. You want to make sure that you build the relationship with your students as soon as possible. The, well, as much as you can. The more you can relate, begin to build that relationship, you will be able to make your class that much more relevant. Why? Because you will know their interests. You will know what motivates them. And I'm going to give you some concrete examples. So let's keep going. So who is your audience? You know their students. Again, you want to build that relationship. But what happens if you start off online? Hmm. What or actually who is behind the computer? Perhaps they're not as engaged as you think. You'd like to think they're engaged, that they're moving along, but maybe they're not even sitting behind the computer. 
But the more you know about them, the more you get to know about them, the more engaging and relevant you can make your class, the more likely they are to have the actual students show up behind the class. Behind. So first off, be authentic. Be genuine. You have to be you. And be you know why? Because students can tell behind a computer or face to face if they are getting the real deal. So students need to be themselves. And so if you are yourself, then they feel safe and they feel comfortable and they're ready to take some risks. Without authenticity, it's often that what we teach is a foreign language because the student doesn't feel as if they can become themselves. And so it's a difference between it being a foreign language and it being a world language. So I'd like to dedicate this to my coworker, Dick Berkeley, who died last week. Um, and only because his quote, he was a great Spanish teacher. He was a great watcher of souls and he was very empathetic. But he left this quote, people like it when you let them see your soul. And I think that's really key, the being genuine and being authentic. So I'm putting this group up here, Choke Keep Town. So this is a part of my being authentic. Uh, I taught a different class, and I'm going to show some examples later on about this class. It was a Spanish 2 class, and it had been a while since I taught Spanish 2, and I'm going to have the pleasure of t teaching Spanish 2 again this year. And I had to change up some things. So I had to go and find some things that would be relevant to them. We were doing Sayre and the Star. We were doing grammar. We were doing lessons. We were doing um, what do you like? We All of the same typical Spanish level two topics. And what I noticed was that the examples didn't reflect my students in that class. However, after a little research, I found a group called Chokey Town, and we had a lot of fun with them. We'll talk about that a little bit. All right, so let's keep going. So the next thing is I talked about coronavirus a little bit. And coronavirus is one of the other ways that I showed my students um, how to stay relevant. We learned about coronavirus at the end of January. And I typically pick things from the current event so that students will have something to discuss with someone from um the target culture or someone in their community or maybe someone in their own family. So the students read about coronavirus and then students did different kinds of activities. So one group, for example, summarized the article, chose vocabulary words, and then chose a picture so that they would be able to discuss coronavirus when we would have a discussion about it. Another group prepared uh, public service announcements where they could talk about, again, the symptoms, they could use the vocabulary, but they could also give recommendations. How relevant, how timely. We had no idea how timely at that point. As we moved on, the students were dismissed to their classrooms, meaning their homes, and we created memes that they found from different parts of the world where they were discussing coronavirus and jokes. So they could relate to that. Prior to the uh, being, I guess, dismissed for coronavirus, the students watched the Super Bowl and we talked about, for example, the Champeta Challenge because everyone had watched the Super Bowl and everyone had watched J-Lo and Shakira. And then we talked about what were some of the products they saw, what were the practices, what were the perspectives, why were some people outraged at the Super Bowl show, why were some people thrilled at the Super Show? at the Super Bowl show. And some of that was based on perspectives. So we talked about the roots and the history of that. Again, keeping it relevant to the students, keeping it open. So you need to be open. Being open means that your students might present an idea to you that might not be exactly the way you were thinking about it. As long as you've set your goals and your students have set your goals, how you go about doing it might need to be a little different. So let your students set their target. What is it that you need them to be able to do? I need it, for example, in my level two class, I need it for them to be able to introduce and describe themselves. I needed them to be able to talk about what they liked, learned, and what they did. And that's how we ended up working with Chokeep Town because they started 
they were able to say, I like this or I don't like this, but they had more games. So this student, this was my new student in the spring, decided that the learning targets were the following. To learn how to run an agility course, to run through a tunnel, run through weave poles, and to jump a hurdle. So after two, three weeks of consistent practice, student completed the goal. And that was exciting for both the teacher and the student. And that's what you want. You always want to be relevant and you always want to be somewhat exciting. I mean, not always exciting, but engaging and exciting. So what's next? We said about, we said being open, but you also might have to be flexible. You may have to change the platforms you use. You may have to go back to a certain platform. So I know that my students expect to talk about current events. I kind of have a reputation now. So we have discussions on a weekly basis or bi-weekly basis. And the students realize that the work that we do leading up to that is very, very important to make them successful when they're having the discussions. So when we have a chance to practice, be it vocabulary practice, be it a one-on-one -on -one pair share, that allows them, they know that there, there's an absolute end. They know that this will be applied in a very efficient manner or sometimes not so efficient, depending, but it will give them, they have a reason to practice. So 60 seconds, three minutes, five minutes, they're very focused. So being open, as I said, means you have, you may have to move platforms you might most certainly <laughs> have to move platforms. So what works with blended, hybrid, traditional, or vice versa? You may go forward, you may go backwards. So I use a number of tools traditionally in my classroom. And I always want to make sure that my students uh, know how to use these, pla these platforms before I send them to do something at home, for example. So again, if you have the opportunity to start with a traditional classroom, then maybe you want to use a couple of tools at the beginning so that the students are anchored and then maybe you could work some more in. So I used the following voice thread. Um, Nearpod was one we used, we were beginning to use. We began to use more during COVID. Padlet, as you saw when we did the memes where they, the students put up the memes. But we also have sort of discussion boards where students can just put a comment up. So they were used to, accustomed to doing that. Um, Flipgrid, we were using, and then Edpuzzle. So these were all different ways that students could um, have an opportunity to discuss. And you can keep your class lively and relevant in the time. So the students use VoiceThread, which is an oral discussion thread. It's been around for a while. And they talked about beauty, definitions of beauty. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, etc. So sometimes the students would have to share a picture and then discuss and then the students would comment on whether or not they liked the picture or they didn't like the picture, depending on the level of language. I like the picture because blah, 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 or in, up to my AP class where they really discussed um, more things. The Nearpod, in your opinion, who is the Ch Chilean, the most important Chilean? The students would have a traditional project. We, well, we ended the year with a traditional project with famous Chileans, but we, we ended up having to move it to the Nearpod where the students discussed who they thought was the most influential. We went on and the students talked about um, Flipgrid. We did, we used Flipgrid, I'm sorry. And we used Flipgrid to discuss what they had learned about Patagonia. So you have to keep your class relevant. You can keep them on track, but relevancy becomes really important. So this year coming in, I'm going to incorporate more. I used Edpuzzle, but I'm going to use my focus this year to do a little bit more with the Black Lives Matter. And we're going to do connections and we're going to do comparisons. So I found a video that was called Being Black in Spain. And this is a student, is an American student, 
who went to be an au pair in Galicia. And she talks about her adventures. And I, you can use this um, tool to have, watch the have the students watch the video and then answer questions. So we use this um, in the past when we talked about um, Mexican students or Mexican young people moving to Norway. And why would they why would they go there and what was the purpose um and i'm going backwards there we go so here we go so why would they move to norway and some of the reasons were well they had family there some wanted adventure but again things that were fresh and would be exciting for the students to be able to see being relevant means being prepared to fail so I'm going to come to that in a minute. I'm going to leave this one because I think everyone knows that if your students like things, then that's one of the things you, you take advantage of. It keeps your class relevant as long, especially if it's interesting to them and it's timely. It's on key. Let them make that video. Let them make that flip grid. Let them make that one thing because you can do that in a traditional classroom or you can do that in um, uh, online. So I'm going to go back for a moment and look at this class. This was my class that changed, I ch changed out of the box. And I have, uh, you'll see that there are two white students and two black students, and this was only one group. So these students were not, were my non-traditional learners. However, they were excited when I changed up the, how the paradigm. We were not going to do basic things, but we're going to use vocab puzzles. We were going to use the, the technology that perhaps they didn't always have an opportunity to use. Uh, now, obviously, my classroom won't look like this, even if we have a traditional classroom, but they could use this particular puzzle and they could do it individually. They did use, um, I did use screencast to give them instructions so that they would know how to do the homework every night and that that was helpful to them because most times students will go home and try to do homework as soon as they reach a barrier they stop and then they'll come back the next day and say well I didn't know how to do it well that's a lot of time when if they have an opportunity to have the instructions going through right at that moment that may allow them to complete the task so I would had I walked through walked the students through what it was they needed to do, including how they were to respond. I tried my best not to have paper, which I think is going to be quite useful this year to not have to have as little paper as possible, um, and it will it allowed my students the flexibility to do some things that they didn't realize that they could do because it was relevant, it was fresh. I was being authentic and they could be authentic. Now, I'm going to, I said that earlier and I say this again, be prepared to fail. Um, I've seen a bunch of posts or things like first attempt in learning or things of that nature. But I mean, you're going to try some things, they're going to work and you're going to try some things and they're not going to work. And that's okay because you're learning and we all have to be lifelong learners. So set up the things that you know will work. Feedback for your students, automatic feedback. That's a be proactive. That's a keep the effective filter low. That's feel free. Works out. So what am I going to do now? Well, I am going to keep looking for new resources because again, being familiar, being simple, being proactive, all of those will help. But to keep it relevant, you have to keep moving. So my goal this time is to look at the more of the Afro-Colombians, look at the Afro-Mexicans, and to incorporate more of that into my class because I think it will help make my class more vibrant, more authentic, more representative, and the students will know what's going on. So I'd like to thank you for listening, and I hope that this year will be your best year ever, and you will have an opportunity to be proactive and make sure that your classes are relevant in 2020. Good luck this year.